Thank you again. How's it going? All right. We've lost a few people at the break. My draw is not once what it, what it once was. Um, so this is great. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Bosworth. Most people do call me Boz. It is uh, pretty cool to go by one name. Zuck kind of beat me to it, but I'm still going to take credit for it. I've been at Facebook for 11 years, so when I joined, it was actually still called The Facebook. It's so obviously before Justin Timberlake <laughs> taught us you know, what was cool and what's not cool, which clearly I've embodied now. Uh, we talked about, yeah, I've worked on Newsfeed, Messenger, Groups. Today, I'm, I'm running the ads, pages, local platform and marketplace teams at Facebook. Uh, and we're here at the, the Transformation Conference to talk about the future. We are all terrible at predicting the future, myself included. So I'm not going to give you a lot of prognostications about what it will look like. But I will talk through some systems, some ideas of how to prepare yourself for change. Uh, these are dramatically changing times. And so I guess, broadly speaking, the talk of today's, the theme of today's talk is innovation. What it is, what it isn't, how to recognize it when it shows up on your doorstep wearing a hoodie. Now, I know some of you might be looking for real actionable marketing tips on how to turn passion into action. That sounds like a tagline for Tinder, and it's not really what this talk is about. You know, this is not, not about some, some buzzwordy bullshit. This talk is about some real opportunities that each of you have today to change the core of your business for the better and how to take advantage of those changes. Um, so here's how it works. The innovation pivot is a three-step dance. First, you have to understand what it is that you actually do. Then second, you have to structure yourself for success. You have to adapt. And then third, you have to really take risk. You have to commit to the change when the time comes. So we're gonna go through these one at a time. Uh, first, you know, understanding what it is you actually do. You know, this sounds simple, but I think it's actually the hardest one. I'm gonna start with an example uh, from industrial era New England. So a little call and response here. Can anyone shout out, what do you think the biggest industries were in industrial era New England? Shout them out. I've, textiles, I heard textiles, I heard a lot of things. I heard shoes, maybe shoemaking, guns. I'm hearing, a, I'm hearing one with surprising frequency, which I'm enjoying. It is ice. By the way, everyone else is also right, so you should, everyone, let's get a round of applause. Full credit, this group paid attention in history, probably more than I do. I'm not sure about shoes. Shoes feel small, but tech, everything else felt pretty good. Um, ice. Ice was a massive industry for industrial era in New England. Uh, some of the world's richest families who lived in the stateliest manners were the barons of the ice trade, which is a great name for a band. By the way, Barons the Ice Trade. In fact, the site of Trump Tower was once the site of the mansion of Charles W. Morse, the Ice King of New York, which doesn't mean the same thing today as it once did, but that's pretty good. But how do they make ice in the 19th century? It's before refrigeration. Well, got yourself a sharp saw and got out to a frozen lake in winter, and you got to cutting. Literally had to go to a lake carve it up, put those blocks on a horse cart, wrap it in straw, take it to market. It was just a very labor-intensive uh, profession. That made ice a luxury good. One of the coolest things you could do for a friend was put ice in their drinks. Yeah, coolest. A lot of ice jokes in here, so stay with me. Um, but, so all that luxury, all that work, that made uh, ice big money for those ice barons. But then something happened in a story all too familiar to those of us in Silicon Valley, an entrepreneur came up with an invention that would change the ice-making game. A Florida doctor by the name of John Gorey patented one of the first ever refrigeration devices in the United States. This is 1851, pre-Civil War. Got himself a nice little write-up in Scientific American. And that little write-up caught the attention of those uh, ice barons up in their ice palaces. Now, what do you think they did about this? Do you think they called Dr. Gorey up to buy his patent? Did they incubate this technology that could reduce the labor requirements of their profession? <laughs> no, of course not. No, they fought a PR war against it instead. They went full Luddite. When Dr. Gorey went to New Orleans to seek venture capital, they sabotaged him behind closed doors. 
Dr. Gorey died a broke and broken man. But the technology persisted. The PR war expanded. They said lake ice was natural. Lake ice cleaned the air. Sure, why not? But the technology got better and better, cheaper and cheaper. And before long, no one was drinking lake ice anymore. I mean, now if they had pivoted, these once great ice companies might still be around today. Refrigeration is the cornerstone of globalization. It's been a huge boon to human health and nutrition. And air conditioning is not too bad either. And if they had taken advantage of this technological innovation, the ice companies might have been the ones to bring all of that to the world and profit from all of it. But instead, they're just a punchline in my talk. And that's cold. <laughs> I like you guys. This is good. Uh, so they, you know, what happened? How did they miss this obvious thing? You know, why didn't the ice barons embrace the ice machine? It's not because they were too big. You know, failure to innovate is not a function of size. It's a function of vision. The ice companies were too focused on their product, on their identity of being people who carved up lakes, to see the opportunity right in front of them. They didn't sell ice. They sold refreshment, and they sold refrigeration. Dr. Gorey and his ice machine weren't a threat to their business. He was their savior. To pick another example, this is the first ever digital camera. It was invented by Kodak in the 1970s. They invented the digital camera. Kodak invented it. But they passed on this innovation because they didn't think anyone, anyone would want to look at photos on screens. Yeah, that's a miss. That's a miss. Um, and besides, you know, they made a ton of money selling film. But film wasn't really their product. Memories were their product. They sold the content of the film, not the media of the film. And because they didn't understand that, they passed on the opportunity to, to shape the future of the world. Now, we all know the standard barriers to innovation, you know, legal, social, technological, but there's an even bigger barrier I'm touching on here, and that's ideological. Companies often fail to embrace opportunity, not just because they're stuck in the present moment, but because they're stuck in something even kind of harder to escape, which is an inflexible conception of what it is that they do. I don't want to get all Burning Man on you guys, but what you what you do may not be the same thing as what you sell, right? It's not what people are paying you money for, it's why are they paying you that money? That's what the ice barons didn't get or the people who made film. They let these changes in technology pass them by because they identified more with their process and their product than what they did for the world. They became their product, not their service, right? They became what they sold, not what they did. They identified with their past and their present at the expense of their future. And I don't want anyone here to fall into that same trap. You know, don't be bound by your identity, by what you've done in the past, by what you're doing today. See opportunity and change instead. And if you do, you won't get frozen out. Okay, I've, I've pushed it too far. I understand. Good feedback, good feedback. So I've talked a lot about other companies, but Facebook faced this challenge also. Uh, you know, when I joined Facebook in 2006, we were still a college-only social network. And there was a really big debate inside the company about whether or not we should open up beyond colleges. Now, given how things have played out, that may sound surprising. Uh, but you have to, you know, rewind the context. In 2006, many inside the company believed this was an existential threat to us. They thought it would kill the business. So how did we decide to open up? Well, we realized something very fundamental. Our product is connection. And so if we pass up on any opportunity to connect people, we're just letting our customers down today and creating the opportunity for our competitors to beat us tomorrow. And that's bad business. Now, I know it's not always easy to recognize a pivot point when it comes. Retrospect is an incredibly privileged 
position from which to judge, and I respect that. I think it would have been very hard for Kodak to foresee the rise of mobile phones back in the 1970s, so they get a pass. That would have been tough. But there is one trend happening here today in 2017 that no one in this room will be forgiven for missing. It's a piece of the future we can all see coming, and it's mobile. Mobile is just a piece of the future that we can all see coming, and we're still not doing enough about it. I mean, half the presentations here are going to talk about marketing, but are they really talking about the way marketing will be delivered to people in the future? Now, I hear a lot of people talking about the mobile revolution in the past tense. They describe winners and losers. Those people are wrong, or at the very least, they're premature. The majority of the impact mobile phones are going to have on our society and on our business is still ahead of us and has not nearly been realized yet. The only question those of us in this room get to answer is this one. Will we innovate to take advantage of the opportunity it creates, or will we let the tide wash over us? The second thing, once you figure out what it is that you really do, the second thing you want to spend time on is structuring yourself for success. Uh, and to do that, it starts with the organization of your organization. You know, I'll tell another example from Facebook. Uh, when I, you know, today Facebook has over one and a half billion people using mobile per day on Facebook, which is incredible. But of course, when I joined in 2006, we didn't have a mobile app. We didn't have a mobile site. Facebook was desktop only. Now, I think, to be fair, back then, mobile phones couldn't really do that much. Uh, they could make phone calls. Do you guys remember phone calls? It was, a big, it was a big thing a few years ago. Yeah, still. Uh, maybe play you a game of Snake if you had one of these sweet Nokia phones. Snake fans in the room? Yeah, this, this is, that's good. If you didn't raise your hand, you missed out, and I feel bad for you. Um, but, but the ground really shifted, obviously, when the iPhone came out. Uh, and this, is a, this was a, a kickoff for us where by 2012, more than half of Facebook users were accessing Facebook by mobile. But we were still a desktop-oriented company. You know, we had hundreds of engineers working on the desktop version of Facebook, facebook.com, and like 30 engineers off in the corner working on our mobile app. And if you just do that math, it doesn't make any sense. You can't have 30 people trying to replicate in real time the work of hundreds of people. It's not going to yield good results. But we realized that if our product is connection, you know, we had to be honest that mobile was going to be a bigger part of how people connected in the future than desktop was. So we made a change. We changed the org structure. Rather than having separate mobile teams and desktop teams, we made sure every team was responsible for both desktop and mobile versions of their products. And in fact, Mark Zuckerberg would end any meeting immediately if a team didn't bring him a mobile version of the product first. So we made the shift. We became mobile first. Engagement took off. A lot of people were expecting us to go the way of uh, MySpace and Friendster. And it didn't happen. But it could have. <laughs> but it didn't happen, so it's fine. <laughs> but it could have. It's fine. it's fine. So to pick a parallel example from the ads industry, you know, if you have a mature traditional ads team and a small digital ads team, you got to ask yourself, are you really setting them up for success? I mean, we heard Mark Pritchard say that earlier today on stage. You know, if every other status quo money-making part of your organization is fully staffed, is this tiny silo really going to be effective? Can they really affect the level of change in your organization required to adapt to the shift to mobile? You know, just like our siloed mobile team couldn't keep us up to date on mobile, neither can your siloed digital ads team. The organization matters a lot, and therefore the integration matters a lot. New ideas can't just be <laughs> put off in an innovation division, you know, given just enough resources to prove the naysayers right. That's not how you affect change of the scale required by the shift to mobile. So don't silo innovation, integrate it. And the last point is that real pivots require real commitment. You know, imagine a railroad company uh, in the 1950s around the peak of passenger rail transport in America, seeing airplanes as an opportunity, 
had created a small 30-person airplane division to explore with small aircraft. That never would have been enough to realize the dream of air travel that we all know today, right? All that approach does is get you close enough to see the summit that you're not willing enough to climb. Zuck once observed that uh, companies fail in one of two ways. They either set ambitious goals and they miss them, or they set mediocre goals and hit them all the way down to obsolescence. Most companies fail in the second way. There's a lot of talk in Silicon Valley about pivots, pivoted all over the stage, kind of a jargon term at this point. But the real idea behind pivots is a valuable one, which is there will come a point in your business where you have to make a change to the core of how you operate. And when that time comes, you can't half-ass it. You have to go all in on that change. There's another quote I like from a marketer in the 1920s by the name of John Shedd. A ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. And it reminds me that sometimes the riskiest move is not to risk everything, or at least risking more than you're comfortable risking. Growth happens in places of deep discomfort and nowhere else. To bring this back to Facebook, you know, how are we incorporating this idea? Well, you know, we have a few surprising investments in our portfolio. You, know, you might reasonably ask yourself, what's a social network doing building a fleet of solar-powered airplanes? Why are we so invested in artificial intelligence? And what is the deal with Oculus? Well, I'll tell you. Our product is connection. And we cannot hope to realize the dream of connecting people if four billion humans don't have internet access. So we're building planes to fly it to them. And we want to connect people across language barriers and across the barriers of disability and service content to them in the most relevant and interesting way possible. So we invest in artificial intelligence. And of course, eventually, we hope to allow people to have rich, engaging experiences with one another without being bound by the barrier of physical proximity. With virtual reality and augmented reality, we hope to do for interaction what the telephone did for conversation. But underlying all these efforts are two things. One is our mission, to make the world more open and connected. And the second is our brand. Now, this crowd knows more than I do about brands. You know, they're not just the name of things. Brands are uh, actually an important technology. Brands have helped humanity scale from connected villages to a connected world. Uh, so let's talk about some of the jobs that brands do. You know, first is they certainly express some identity. They help express information about products. So I can order a Jack Daniels here in LA and it'll taste the same as it does anywhere in the world. And that's pretty comforting. In addition to that, brands express an, uh, some idea of values. So today I'm here on stage, it's hard to see because it's below me. These are Star Wars themed Adidas sneakers. And you can learn something about me from these shoes. That I'm a nerd. But like maybe a slightly cool athletic nerd? That's like my niche. So just spread the word to your friends, tell people who ask you. Um, so there's, a, there's this idea that there's, there's an identity to a brand, there's, a, there's an expression of values to the brands. But they also do something else. As technologies change, brands are a tool that allows companies to survive that change and even profit from it. A brand is a technology of persistence, right? It can communicate that identity and that information across products and into new categories and new markets. It allows your product, your company, to evolve with the inevitable progression of time and technology. It's what allows Facebook to pursue connections from desktop to mobile to emerging markets to virtual reality and beyond. Some of my favorite brands really get this. You know, there's a pretty good example of Starbucks used to sell whole beans and coffee equipment until the founders went to Milan and saw how coffee shops could be, and decided to go all in on that strategy instead. As an interesting historical note, I'm told that Maxwell House considered doing the same thing way back in the 1920s, and decided not to. How different a future we might see if they had not made that decision. 
The first products that Sony made were rice cookers and electric blankets. So the founder saw uh, an announcement that Bell Labs had patented the first transistor and booked the first flight to New York to license that technology. And today, not only from electronics to movies, Sony's a huge part of the global economy. And of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with Netflix, which started mailing physical media to people. But then upon seeing the disruption of the internet and streaming, made that their business model instead. Realizing, of course, that they were in the business of entertainment and not media distribution. You know, there's a quote that I think we all know and love from Henry Ford. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. It's a great quote. It's almost too perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because it is too perfect. Henry Ford never actually said this, or at least there's no evidence of it. Uh, so, you know, don't believe everything you read uh, from me. Uh, it's not all, check your sources by all means. But even if it's not a true quote, I think it is an accurate one. You know, uh, I think we have to be remembered that innovation, new ideas are going to sound ridiculous at first. We have to be willing to leave the pack and not stay with what everyone else is doing or thinking or saying. We have to be willing to be different, to take advantage of opportunities of this scale. And you have to frame your work so that you can see technological change as an opportunity and not a threat. Right? You have to structure yourself so that when the time comes, your organization will adapt. And of course, you have to commit to it. You have to commit to the difference, ideally all under a brand that enables progress. You know, there are a lot of ICE companies here in the room. There have been ICE companies on the stage today. You know it and I know it. And they're talking a lot about how much they wish you still were carving up frozen lakes. And they're fighting PR wars against technology. But for all the good it's gonna do them. It is those who are willing to be different and embrace the technology that will survive. And if you aren't ready to adapt, I have bad news for you. Your ice castle, it's not just melting. It's on fire. This was the payoff, so let's just give it a minute. Pretty, all those ice jokes got us to this point, and it was totally worth it for me. All right, all right, all right. sorry. Look, the future is on, oh, that, this is really hard to get this slide off, apparently. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the future is unwritten. The past only feels like a narrative. And the present is too damn exciting to trudge into obsolescence, setting mediocre goals. So that's my talk. I'm gonna go find some ice, preferably swimming in some Jack Daniels, and I'll think about the future. Thank you. <laughs>